So welcome to Practical Performance Practices. Um, I didn't intentionally make a tongue twister, but I've been told it's practically one, <laughs> if you will. So all the slides for this presentation are on my GitHub account, uh, lefticus slash presentations. I am the co-host of CBPcast, which is a podcast for C++ developers. If you haven't heard of it, check it out. Um, I am the co-author of ChaiScript and started a YouTube series with C++ stuff on it recently, which um, you might want to check out. Anyhow, I'm an independent contractor, so if anyone wants to talk about work, let me know. Um, and I do prefer an interactive session. Please stop me, ask questions, raise your hand, whatever you need to do. Yell if I don't see you. So, first thing I want to mention is that optimizing compilers are absolutely amazing for what they can do today. I don't know about you guys, but I'm very surprised to learn that this code compiles down to one single statement, return the value one, with GCC 5.1 uh, 5 and above. And I mean, if you stop and think about it, this should be having to construct a string and then get the size back and destruct it and everything, but that GCC 5.1 is able to completely remove the entire code and return one. So. What do you think this code would look like when it's fully optimized? Yes, you would think so. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what it does. That's amazing. <laughs> it's shockingly easy to break the optimizer or to confuse it, get it outside of what it can do. And in fact, uh, GCC is the only compiler that I played with that can actually compile down that first example down to a single statement to the point that it almost makes me wonder if they have a special test case in the optimizer. <laughs> so, optimizing compilers is amazing, but trying to predict exactly what it can optimize is a risky game, which is the point of this talk. We're going to talk about everyday things that you can do to just make sure that your code performs well. So uh, this is based on my experience with ChaiScript, which is my embedded C++ uh, scripting engine for C++. Performance measuring in ChaiScript was very difficult. Uh, we have a great number of template instantiations, so the code is spread out over a ton of different functions that all look the same. They're all different instantiations of the same template. And the nature of how our scripting engine works means that execution is spread out over many similar functions like this. It's weird that the color is different. Um, so this is a simple script. I am setting x equal to 0, and then I have a for loop for i uh, 0, i less than 100, plus plus i. And so basically, I'm summing all the integers from 0 to 99. And we directly parse it. So you've got the AST that parses a file, and we have an equation with a var declaration of x and we are assigning x equal to zero, so that's the first statement. And then we have our for loop, and you have the precondition for the for loop where it is creating the var called i, assigning it to zero, and then the loop conditional, uh, I think that's the right word, where we are um, checking to see if i is still less than 100, and then we increment i, and then we execute the block, and we've got our equation with a plus equal and x and i on either side. All right. so. What this looks like is basically, since these are all subclasses of the same base class, we're calling eval internal down the entire tree. So this is the kind of profiling information I tend to get back. We have eval internal calling eval internal, and it's taking 100% of the processing. So this led to the rules and practices that I now follow. All right. This is the slide I promised before the talk started. Might get us all hung up. So which is better for default normal use, vector or list? We can do a hand raise. Who would say list is better to use by default? One person. Who would say vector is better to use by default? Great. Why? That's an answer. Anything else? 
What's that? Contiguous memory, which leads into cache friendliness. Uh, locality, same kind of idea. No jumping pointers. No jumping pointers. Which, again, is about cache locality, but not completely. Right. It's extra ops. Random access. Yeah. Less allocations. Uh, less allocations. Hey, yeah. Easier for the compiler. What was that? Easier for the compiler to analyze. Easier for the compiler to analyze. Yes, uh, yeah, that's, it's, all right, all great reasons. And I, I, I debated that I could just put this slide up here and we could discuss this for an hour and a half and we would suss out most of the things that I'm going to cover. So let's talk about what standard list has to do. I want to create a list of exactly one integer. What is this code going to do? A dynamic allocation, how many? At least one, okay. Um, all right, well, well, we'll we'll jump into it. Um, now, uh, my my uh, assembly is not perfect by any means, but we're definitely creating a new object, and we're creating a new object. It seems of list node base type, and we then have to delete. So, so we're creating the list node, and then we have to delete the list node on destruction. And somewhere in here, oh, here we go. Here we're actually moving in the, uh, somewhere, somewhere in here, we're actually assigning the value one. And that must be that line. Where we're actually assigning the value one to our, and anyhow. So it has to do all this, and it has to delete, and it has to have some sort of um, exception handling routine. Uh, I guess in case an exception were to be thrown during the construction of the list node. So allocate a new node, handle exceptions, assign the value. Uh, you have to hook up the begin and end pointer since it's a doubly linked list. Delete the node, whatever else. What does vector have to do in exactly the same situation? Anyone? Allocate a buffer. Assign the value, delete it. That's it. So allocate a buffer, assign the value, delete the buffer. What does this code compile down to? Anyone know? Nothing. Exactly, nothing. It gets completely compiled away, and we even get an optimized zero return with an XOR instead of just returning zero. <clears throat> Um, I believe it's because it doesn't have to allocate any internal data structure. It's just the the buffer itself, and not the node. Yes, optimizing compilers are amazing. Very good answer. So, part one: don't do more work than you have to. So, sum up what we just talked about, and I'm. Um, there's, I'm presenting a lot of information, and hopefully I don't move too fast or too slow through it, but um, I'm going to have wrap-ups in, in individual sections. So always prefer standard array, then standard vector, and only use any other container type if you have a really, really good reason to. And whatever reason you think you have is probably not good enough. And, and in general, make sure you understand what you're asking the library to do. All right, what is, yes? Uh, we don't have the sheets we usually have. Oh, that's first. fine. So please repeat the questions. Then. Yes, OK. Um, what, what is, what is uh, in ideal with this code? We're not constructing this code. Yes. There's a memory Marshall. allocation and a copy there. Yes, a memory allocation. Well, uh, yes. Well. Maybe not a memory allocation here, right? With small string optimizations. It depends on which version of C++ you're using. Yeah, it depends on which version of C++, yeah. But in general, you, uh, the, everyone's got the right idea. We're constructing an object, then assigning it. And I found in my own code bases that this kind of thing, I mean, this is an obvious example. But this kind of thing is easy to do in lots of places in your code. 
So you construct the string, reassign it. So this is my next practice. Always use const. And the point of saying always use const is that it forces you to give a meaningful value on the construction of your objects. So this silly little example, construct initialize one step, is 32% more efficient than the first one. So if you have code that's called often that's not giving an appropriate value to the object when you construct it, potentially huge efficiency loss. But maybe you say, I have a value that I have to make several decisions to decide what it should be assigned to. How do I use const here? This is one of my favorite examples. Yes. Yay, that's my favorite. You put it in a small lambda function. And you can immediately invoke it, like the JavaScript guys like to do. And we get the same kind of 30% approximately efficiency gains by simply making sure that we construct our string with an appropriate value. Um, I, I hope everyone here is using initializer lists. But let's run over this example real quick. Because this, this bit of code gets used in several examples now. I have this struct called int. It is taking a string in its constructor. We are assigning the member <coughs> string, m underscore s. And then we have this function called val that returns the a2i of the string so that we get back an actual integer of the string that it was constructed with. So same issues with previous examples. We should be using an initializer list. And this, this uh, idiom, I forget what it's called, it's, it generally works well, where if you know that you're going to take a copy of a parameter in your constructor, then you make it a copy and you move it into place. OK. Same gains as the const initializers that we were talking about. All right, what's wrong with this code? Yes? Right, we should do the a to i in the constructor and just store the integer. But you skipped like two slides ahead of where I wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is, we are calling the a to i every time val is called. So we could do a calculate on first use, but this code isn't great. Um, does anyone see a, a bug in this code, first of all? Well, you decided this calculated to be true. Yeah, you, you see, the more complicated the code, the harder it is, or the, the easier it is to introduce bugs into it. We don't have is calculated is never set. So we also have another problem with it, though, that is breaking one of the, What's that? We are racing. You may be doing more work than you need to. Racing is not a problem because this is clearly single threaded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the comment was racing is not a problem because this is clearly single threaded code. Uh, just for the record, this comes from an example that is not single threaded. And yes, we are uh, potentially racing if it's multi threaded. But more to the point, core guidelines and uh, Herb Sutter tells us that const methods should be thread safe. And this is a const method, therefore it should be thread safe. And as we already pointed out, is calculated, isn't being set correctly. So we fixed it, and we fixed our thread safety issues by using atomics now. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why not? It's, it's doing more work than it needs to. It's doing more work than it needs to be doing. That's the title. What's that? Thrashing the cache. Because of the atomics? Yeah. Thrashing the cache? Really? Potentially. Oh, potentially thrashing the cache. OK. That's a good point. Um, yeah, and, and there is actually no race condition left, though, because we might do more work than we need to do, because multiple threads might enter this function for the first time at the same time. Uh, but anyhow. But we also have this branch that's unnecessary. Atomics are slower. So we get to the answer that was preemptively given to us. 
no branching, no atomic, smaller runtime, we're storing an int versus a string. This example in ChiScript took me two years to realize that I was doing this every single time that someone wanted to access an integer. I had just never noticed because of the nature of profiling this application, never bubbled up. So that is a 10% perfor performance improvement across the board right there. So don't do more work than you have to. And this is my next practice. The simpler solution is almost always the best solution. So, um, yes, question. Well, because we're no longer storing the string, yeah. then yes, we want to do a const reference here because if no, if you're storing the string, you probably want to take it by copy because that, in the optimal case, um, can do a move or it can do a construction in place, I believe. Um, and uh, un, uh, otherwise, it might have to take a copy. And in this case, it would always have to take a copy if we were storing the string. So it, it's, it's the kind of thing, if you use um, uh, Clang Modernize, uh, will automatically do that kind of conversion for you. Um, it, 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 it has helped in my code. Great example of Scott Meyer's effective modern. Yes, an effective modern. So apparently, item 43 of effective C++, <laughs> effective modern C++. Actually, for the best performance, we should get another load for an error body reference. Yes. So the comment was, for the absolute best performance, you might want an overload for const reference and an overload for R value reference. Um, Myers, I believe, his argument is that's optimization, where this is doing the right thing by default. Um, so, also perfectly what's that? Also perfectly forward the string. Oh, to perfectly forward the string, right? Did you have a comment? I, I think I want a string wrap there instead of a, a yeah. reference. To a <laughs> yes, a string view. You want a string oh view. yes, <laughs> maybe you want a string view here, but we are sticking in C plus plus fourteen ish. Uh, the other thing. <laughs> The reason you might not want string view here is because if you have a string view, you can't call ATOI because it expects a null termination. And string views are not okay. null termination. So the comment was, the reason I would not want a string view here is because A to I wants a null terminated string, and string views are not null terminated. So why don't we have an ATOI that takes two iterators yet? Because nobody's written that paper. <laughs> okay. I, actu I actually did have to write my own for Chai script. I wrote my own too sure. for that reason. Yeah. Seriously, write a paper proposal. Okay. I might do. <laughs> if he tells you to write a paper, write a paper. <laughs> Listen to Marshall. <laughs> okay, so uh, the comments in the gallery here are that someone needs to write a paper to propose an A to I that takes uh, two iterators so we don't have to have this problem. Right. All right, so sum up here. Always const, always initia initialize. Use your um, immediately invoked functions or lambdas to help you initialize. And don't recalculate values that can be calculated only once. All right. This is another favorite of mine. Can people start pointing out problems with this code where it's not ideal? See if you get several slides ahead of me again. Well, let's assume that we need a virtual destructor because we've got a virtual method and we're hand passing around pointers to base classes. Let's make that assumption and say that that's, that's where we are. You're doing it wrong. You should be using t uh, type erasure. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. <laughs> Comment was, uh, I'm doing it wrong. I should be using type erasure. That's an extra level of indirection, probably, no, you maybe. You one virtual call still. Well, all right. <laughs> Might want to mark derived as final. That's an interesting point. And uh, I didn't actually make any slides on this, but I do have a single keyword in ChiScript, a single place, where if I mark a method as final, I get a 2% performance improvement, which I'm surprised. I was impressed that the compiler was able 
to, to take advantage of it that much. Because I'm pointing around, I'm mostly passing around pointers to the derived class that I have marked the virtual method as final n. Okay, so uh, because we have a virtual destructor, move construction and move assignment is implicitly disabled. So also, virtual of derived uh, destructor is completely unnecessary because the virtual of the destructor in the base class implies a virtual destructor in the derived class. So we need to remove our virtual destructor from our derived class, and we need to explicitly say what kind of move construction, move assignment, copy construction, and copy assignment we want, and because of all that, we also have to give it a defaulted uh, default constructor. Um, but this little bit of boilerplate code right here ensures that all of our derived objects do not, uh, do have move assignment and move construction enabled for them. This, uh, this can be huge. So um, this, this is the rule of zero, essentially. It says, um, try to not define any of the special member functions, and if you have a reason to, define all of them. And this fix for one commonly used class in my system gave me a 10% performance improvement again. So these just keep adding up, these little nitpicky things. Oops. Well, um, so this code, I have my struct s, and we're using this idiom where we're moving things in. All right, so I need to build a string for some reason inside my for loop, and I am copying it into this object. It's, it's a contrived example, 100% guaranteed. So we all know that copying objects is bad, so we're going to move this in, right? Simply making this a move statement makes the code 29% more runtime efficient and a 32% smaller binary for this particular case because there's that much fewer methods being instantiated. But what's better than moving it into place? Constructing it in place. There's no reason for us to ever name this variable in this case. That's another 2% efficiency gain again. What's that? That's sad, actually. It's a little sad, but it's also better because we no longer have this value s that, as we learned in Sean's discussion this morning, is now in a um, defined but uns valid but unspecified state. So this is 2% again. Sometimes, if you're doing a lot of things like this, I, I believe it can read to, uh, lead to less readable code. However, it is taking the don't declare a variable until you need it and can give it an appropriate value thing to its ultimate conclusion. If there's no reason to have a variable, simply don't make a variable. Didn't we invent register allocation so that you didn't need to do that? Didn't we invent register allocation so you didn't need to do that? Okay. Um, you have to be very careful. Don't declare a variable that you don't need because it will get a register. Don't. Like right. Now we're back there where you're like, hey, don't declare this variable because it might cause a call to the constructor and allocate the number. Right. So the comment was we are taking ourselves back to the 70s from before optimizing compilers, essentially. Essentially. Um, Al, I, uh, I'm not a compiler, compiler developer. <laughs> and. I don't see any in the room at the moment. Oh, are you? Yeah. What do you work on? I used to work on Clang. You used to work on Clang, okay. Front end, not optimizing. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if Chandler was going to be here. I thought I might end up giving him a hard time if he was. Um, but no, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't have answers for these things. I know the job is very difficult. I know in ChaiScript, I've been trying to learn some of the techniques that compiler optimizers use. And it's, it feels like magic, honestly. It's, I, think, I think a big problem is that um, C++ does not have destructive moves. 
C++ does not have destructive moves, right? And that means the compiler does not have license. If you declare a variable, it does not have license to say, well, I don't actually need that variable. I can optimize it out. I can optimize the move construction away and just construct in place. Except right. for the specifically defined cases of, empty ba of return value optimization. R okay. Um, so because construct is kind of side effect. So well, okay. It's so even to to, to so uh, the point was that um, the compiler does not have we don't have move destructive moves in C plus plus, so we can't completely optimize away this variable at all. But I'd also like to make another point um, th th that we because S still exists, this code yes it does a move, but S is still a, a left around in that unspecified state. So no matter what we do, it still has to call S's destructor. And if there was some way to say, yes, we've moved it, and we can guarantee that it doesn't have anything that needs to be cleaned up, that would be, so yeah. Right. Yeah, so if the compiler can... Okay. Um, it's, it's a hard thing to get right. It's just, it's doable. It's just that the question is, is it a good practice to try and work around all these things to get a 1 or 2% gain unless you absolutely need it? Right. So is it, is it, it's in the realm of theoretically possible that the compiler could determine that this S does not need to be maintained, but no one's doing it yet, and is it worth going to that level of things? As we already learned, though, optimizing compilers are amazing, though. So maybe we'll get there soon enough. Um, OK, this is another fun one. Ooh. Oh, yeah, I like this one. All right, what's going on here? Anyone? You don't have to copy the shared pointer. You can just pass a reference to it. Uh, yes, I could pass a reference to the shared pointer. No, you pass a reference to the object. Let's start with the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so. We're copying in the shared pointer. So we could pass a reference to the shared pointer instead. All right. Now what are we doing? Confusing people. Yes. <laughs> yes. Intentionally. I am confusing people. And you're forcing every call of user base to have a shared pointer lying around. That's true. I'm, I'm forcing every call. Let's assume that there's a good, well, no, well, no, we won't even assume that right now. Let's just talk about why this slide is particularly bad. Oh, because you're down. Oh, 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 oh. oh yes. yes. Because you're autoing into a derived make shared. I mean, uh, yes. You have a pointer to derived, and then even though you might think you're passing a const ref, right. you're creating a temporary. You're actually creating a temporary of type shared pointer base on the stack, which is imposing a copy of the. Uh, while well, increasing the reference count on the make shared derived that we passed in. That's special. So we fixed it, right? No. Okay. <laughs> By passing a reference, this version is now magically two and a half times faster than the last one. It doesn't compile. It doesn't compile. <laughs> uh, sorry. Yes, that doesn't compile. This should be uh, an asterisk. A star. Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> You know, I did compile, I tried to compile every single one of these examples. All right, so it doesn't compile because git actually turns a pointer and I'm expecting a const reference. Also, in the user base, you want p dot value. And, uh, oh, yes, and you, wow. <laughs> so the bug is actually a lot smaller. You only have to replace the ampersand by a star, and you're fine. Yes, <laughs> that works. You know that might actually explain what happened then in my code. <laughs> What's that? Then Dave will complain. Then Dave will. Yes, right. Because then what happens is someone passes in a null pointer. Okay. So well, anyhow, uh, this is a very sneaky hidden, or it was in the previous example, very sneaky hidden extremely expensive copy operation. So, um, another one of my favorites. 
don't do more work than you have to do with stood end line. Everyone knows what stood end line does? <laughs> Excuse me? The problem starts with the fact that you've got an O stream there, doesn't it? <laughs> well, the comment was the problem starts with the fact that I have an O stream in my function signature. There's a good reason for this, and it will build to a more concrete example in a moment. So, uh, the answers around was every, everyone knows yes, uh, end line sends a flush. It's equivalent to a new line character followed by a flush. Uh, expect that flush to cost you approximately nine times overhead in your I.O. depending on your operating system. My experience, Windows incurs a higher cost than Linux in general. Um, so, this is my real world end line anecdote. We have two functions. Get a file as string and write the file out. So this is why we have our write file that takes an O stream reference. And in this version, um, we are writing it out to a particular file name. And in this version, we are returning a string value that represents the file that we want to create. And we are helpfully sending a end line at the end of every single line. Now, and this is, this is directly related to real world code that I was working on where um, consumers of our library who were calling the code from Ruby were telling us that calling the write file function was like an order of magnitude slower than calling the get a file and writing it out themselves from Ruby. And I argued with them that that was absolutely impossible. And then like two years later I learned why this was happening. So if you're doing a lot of file I.O., be aware of it. Prefer just a uh, new line character. And uh, I, I've been getting a little picky about this myself lately. Um, and I tried really hard to get some good measurements on the difference. But if you use double quotes here, you're technically doing more work. Although the optimizing compilers are amazing. And they mostly get rid of that work for you. So we want to calculate our values once. Obey the rule of zero. If it looks simpler. It's probably faster. Um, avoid copying. Avoid automatic conversions. Don't pass smart pointers. Yes? Yeah, um, I have another reason for not passing smart pointers. OK. And then it, it, it decreases the coupling in your, in your code. If you have okay. stuff, you have utility routines, if you pass <coughs> references or pointers, they don't have to know that things are in a smart pointer, and you don't actually have to go and maybe wrap something in a smart pointer just to pass to this routine. Right. So if you change your data structures so that they're not smart pointer based, none of this other code has to change. Right. So by not using uh, smart pointers, we are decoupling some of the logic dependencies. No, smart pointers in your interface. Not, yeah, don't use smart pointers in the interface. Right. And there's actually some C++ core guidelines specifically about this that basically boil down to don't pass a smart pointer unless you need to confer knowledge of the spec that it's a smart pointer to your colleague. Yes? Yeah, I noticed, sorry, in your OStream examples, you're not actually doing any formatting. So, uh, That's true. In the OStream examples, I'm not doing any actual formatting. I could be calling a raw write command of some sort. Or, yes. Uh, so, um, do I have time? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I have time. Um, you, I, I, so since most of these examples come from ChaiScript, this one in particular did not, I actually did have a user complaining that uh, I.O. was slow on ChaiScript. And it took me a while of digging down into the implementation of the library and realizing what I'm doing. That I, I was using um, uh, O streams, or I was using, so I was sending to standard out. And I was sending it the string, and then I was sending a flush, like your, or a, an inline. And I realized at some point that, I mean, it's, it's my own scripting language. I've already completely formatted the entire string that I need to write out anyhow. So now that bit of ChaiScript actually calls um, puts. So it is the, uh, it's the fastest version on any compiler on any platform I was able to test. It's like couple of orders of magnitude faster than um, calling OStream on Windows. At least it used to be. 
Uh, I know STL has been tweeting a lot about all the performance improvements that he's made in Visual Studio's uh, string, streaming formatters. <coughs> oh, I like this one too. What does this have to do? One malloc and then a dispose. One malloc and then a dispose. I think you're wrong. Malloc for the counter. Yes. Well, no. Well, okay. Because well, because you're using make shared theoretically it merges the two malloc's, right? Yes. Okay, that's true. Right. So technically, yeah, you're right. But it to do two atomic increments. at least yeah, at least no, one no, atomic no, increment. No, yeah, an increment and a decrement. No, Decrements. Two decrements. The initialization should just initialize both both the weak and the strong reference counter to one. Okay. Yes. But it has to decrement both on the destructor. Okay, so it has to do two s atomic increments, two atomic decrements. It should initialize to one. Oh, so, sorry, right. No. So one and then two. No. Wait. And then two. Oh, zero is, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so zero and then two decrements. All right. And, uh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll buy that. So this is what it actually compiles to. We've got, um, well, oh, it also has to do something with the deleter, I believe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh. okay. And, and, and what? The deleter is type erased, so there's going to be an allocation. Right, so yes, the deleter is type erased, so that's possibly another allocation. Good point. So that's, this is the first slide. And, um, so it's, yeah, doing, oops. Um, yeah, so it's, cons it, it has to create all kinds of, of template instantiations that can handle the, the smart pointers, the disposals, uh, the assignment of the value that's being passed in, has to do some atomic e things. That's the technical word, atomic e things. <laughs> um, there's two different calls to delete in here for some reason. Um, and exchange and add more atomic -y things. Okay, so what do we have to do for make unique? New. New. Assign. New, assign, and then delete. New, assign, delete. Exactly. And comparing this to manual memory management of new and delete, it is literally identical. So, um, avoid using shared pointers. Um, this, so this, okay, here we are. We are at the end of part one. Yeah, we're making good time. So avoid shared pointers, avoid inline, always const, always initialize with meaningful values. These, these are the five takeaways from, from part one. Do we have any questions? Yes, in always const. Yes. Um, if the only mutator is the assignment operator, yes. do you declare members const? The only mutator is the assignment. Well, you could cast const away from the this pointer. Oh, <laughs> no. Yeah, so, uh, so always, always const as much as you practically can. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer never allowing casting away const, even though I know there are situations where it's technically correct, and I actually am using it in ChiScript when I know it's technically correct, but I still say that it's something that should only be done in extremely rare cases, not as a normal pattern for things like assignment operators, my opinion. Any other questions before we move on? Yes? Um, your comment of avoid shared pointer, um, I would I would choose a slightly more nuanced thing. Was avoid shared pointer if you don't plan on sharing. Avoid shared pointer if you don't plan on sharing. If you if you you have a data structure where you're sharing things between different things, then shared pointer is the right tool. But unique pointer is a much better tool most of the time. Yes, unique pointer is a much better tool most of the time. And I'm actually going to get to another section here that kind of addresses some of that after I get a drink. Mm. Ponder that code and tell me why you don't like it. <laughs> uh, <yeah. coughs> 
All right. With many template instantiations, this code blows up in size quickly. What we have here are struct D, which is derived from B, very verbose naming I chose for this example. It's a templated derived type. Now, if you notice, this get vec is going to be example, uh, it's going to be exactly the same in every single template instantiation, and so is the vector that it's containing. Now, this might be a bit more obscure compared to most of my examples, but I've personally found that when I have some sort of class hierarchy like this and I'm using um, templates in the inheritance chain, it's easy to accidentally do this. So don't repeat yourself in templates. If there's no reason to have it in a, um, as a virtual method, if there's no reason to have it in the most derived type, move it up a layer if you can. And, yes, in fact, introduce a layer if you have to, and I have done that exact thing. Um, because I had a couple layers and then I had my most derived that was templated. I, I have slides that are almost identical to that tomorrow in my avoid code flow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, the comment was he has slides that are almost identical for his talk. Um, I'm just repeating it for the video. Yes? Yes, I have found that smaller code is faster in very large programs. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to measure sometimes, and, and like if you do something that, that has a, well, okay, you know what, um, I'm going to get to that right now. <laughs> yes? That's another question. Can you go back? Yes. Uh, do you really want to return by value for vector? Uh, that could be a const reference, yes. Um, Yes, you're correct. That because if you only want to inspect it? If you only want to inspect it, you should probably be returning const reference. Um, yes. Uh, depending on you, potentially your thread usage cases for this code. Um, but yes, in general, I would say I should be returning a const reference. Consider this an oversight. <laughs> you couldn't have done that in your example because when you moved you moved from this uh, member from derived to base, right? Yeah, but the this... It doesn't know that derived has this member. It can't, it, it might not be there. Uh, right. So you might be returning a temporary from derived. You might be returning a temporary from derived. So a different oh. class might generate that vector on the fly. Y the yes, a different derived class might have generated the vector on the fly. Your contract is the drive class has to store a vector yeah. that it can return a pointer. In which case, move the vector up. And <laughs> simpler code is better code. OK, factories. Um, oops. We have this factory. Um, we're still kind of using our B and D from the last slide, where one's a template. All right, so for the sake of this contrived example, we are returning 30 different instantiations of struct D. And 30 is actually kind of small compared to what my code actually does. So we are creating a vector of shared pointers that are all constructed with our D factory. We have our shared pointer factory. We are returning make shared. Um, so, and back to the basics, which is a couple years ago at one of the conferences, I think it was before C CPPCon, I think it was in Going Native or something. Uh, at about minute 19, Herb says, prefer returning unique pointers from your factories, um, and then letting your user of your factory decide if they need it to be shared or not, which is leading to the point you were making. So. We also already show that, saw that shared pointer is very big, and we don't want to have to make more than we have to. So instead here, we update our factory to return a unique pointer, and we're using make unique. And by the way, this is the only C++ 14 feature, I believe, in my entire talk is make unique here. I think the rest of this is all C++ 11. 
All right, I should have split this up on better on individual slides for better impact, but so we have the preferred version. Make unique, returning unique pointer. Takes 1.3 seconds to compile on my box, creating a 30K executable using 150 megs of RAM. If we take the original version, where we use make shared and return a shared pointer, it now takes 2.24 seconds to compile, resulting in a 70K executable and using 106, uh, 165 megs of RAM at compile time. And the worst case scenario, we're using make unique inside and then constructing a shared pointer on the way out. 2.4 seconds to compile. Now we're at more than three times the size of the original executable and we're using almost 200 megs of RAM at compile time. Now, I already knew this, but I went back and double checked it in ChiScript because I have factories that I'm using for constructing the wrappers of the functions that are uh, provided by the user. The entire system compiles to five megs if I am using the preferred version. If I'm using the make shared version, it's 7.3 megs and I get an overall 6% slower runtime. Just by these, these are things that are constructed once up front at the beginning of the system and then they live there the rest of the time. So just by nature of having a larger executable, 6% slower. And similarly, if I take the worst case scenario, I'm now at 10% slower than I was. Yes? So, for the sake of argument, why do you even use shared pointers if you have an owner that lives throughout the life of the program? Because it's possible. Why do I have shared pointers if, if, if there's a owner that lives through the life of the program? It's possible that these function wrappers were generated by a loaded module and I want to pass them out of the loadable module into the main runtime. Um, I can, if I were smarter, I could probably get around it. Um, I haven't spent enough time on it yet, but also since these things are almost never copied, uh, I've just kind of let it go at this point. Once I realized that I could, you know, save this. So a quick note about performance when I was testing this. If you know for certain that this is going to be a shared pointer, then this actually has uh, faster raw performance because it has to do less work at runtime. Um, but so if you create many short-lived shared objects, then use the make shared version, return shared pointers. But on the other hand, if you are creating many short-lived shared objects, you probably need to rethink the design of your system. Maybe not, probably. If you're creating long-lived shared objects, definitely want the unique, make unique version. And just a side note, since I've been looking at the core guidelines a lot, there's several examples of factories and like every single one of them does something different. There's no consistency in there. So if anyone who contributes to the core guidelines is interested in cleaning that up, it'd be cool. All right, still talking about smaller code is faster code. I am, I have this function called add. All it does is add two strings together and return the result. It's very simple and contrived. And I'm creating a const uh, std function that returns a string, takes a string by const reference, and I'm binding in hello, and I'm using all of that awesomeness. Does anyone like this version? No, <laughs> no one likes this version. What's that? Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> um, wait, what was different? Oh. Okay, <laughs> I just added the subheading, avoid std function. All right, this is 2.9 times slower than a bare function call. 30% compile time overhead compared to calling the function directly and a 10% compile size overhead. Do we like this version yet? Oh, I, I might give it away here. Never, ever, ever use std bind. <laughs> That's one ever too many. It's, I, I think I need at least four evers based on my experience. Um, 
It is useful for one and one thing only in my experience. Stood bind is useful for exactly one thing, which is? Uh, it takes a variable number of arguments and throws away everything it doesn't need. It takes a variable number of arguments and throws away everything it doesn't need. That's true. And that's part of why it adds such an incredible amount of bloat to your com system. True. <laughs> but if you're binding together stuff that doesn't know the arity yes. of weird places, then it's useful. If you're binding together things that, doesn't know, that don't know the arity, then it can be useful. I ex you shouldn't be doing that anyway. Not oh, that, not OK. That, <laughs> Not that I'm condoning the practice, but <laughs> although sometimes there's a reason to write bad code. Yes, I'm sure there's enough template meta programmers in here to have some argument for why you would need to throw away arity. So um, it's 1.9 times slower now than the bare function call, 15% compile time overhead, and Scott Myers flat out says to never do this. I agree with him. And STL also, when he talks about std function implementation, says don't use bind. So what do we do instead? Use a lambda. This is so much better. Zero overhead compared to a direct function call. Zero percent compile time overhead. It's nearly perfect. That's, that's because that is just a function call. It is just a function call. And, and, and our optimizing compilers are amazing. Because as long as you don't have any captures, it is just a function call. Right, as long as you don't have any captures, it is just a function call. Yes. One of the, the, the more interesting demonstrations of that yes. is if you have a, uh, a lambda function with no captures, yes. you can pass it to set terminate handler, say, which takes a C style function right. as a parameter. And it, not only the compiler takes it, it just works. So if you, if you have a lambda with no captures, you can pass it to even a C style function, a function call that's expecting a C style function pointer. And if I understand correctly, the small function optimization of std function takes advantage of that also. Um, does, that, is that actually explicitly stated in the standard? Oh, okay. I didn't know it was a stated, I, uh, the comment was um, a lambda with no captures is implicitly convertible to a function pointer. And I did not know that that was explicitly stated. You can also explicitly convert it with unary plus. You can explicitly convert it with unary plus. Yeah, like plus and then lambda and you have a uh, function pointer. Plus <laughs> followed by a lambda gives you a function pointer. If there's no captures. If there's no captures. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> unary plus is a pretty amazing thing. <laughs> I've seen some of these unary plus tricks on, um, on Twitter, but um, I can fully admit I have absolutely no idea what that would be doing. It, it just converts it, in this case, it just converts it to a function pointer. It just converts it to a function yeah. pointer, OK. The, the reason why it works is because you can apply unary plus yes. to a function pointer, but you cannot apply it to a lambda, so it forces the implicit conversion to take place. So it's not like it's overloaded for the lambda. Yeah. OK. So you can apply unary plus to a function pointer, which then forces the lambda to be converted to a function pointer. Is that correct? OK. Yes, you explicitly invoke the implicit conversion. You explicitly invoke the implicit conversion <laughs> to a function pointer. <laughs> getting, getting away from esoterics. Um, <laughs> If the reason you made this little lambda is that you want to call it a lot with different values for b, yes. it might be worth it to construct a std string object with the value hello outside, capture it, and then pass it to add so that it doesn't have to construct the temporary std string on every call. Or just S capture it. So move capture it. the comment was, capture it, yeah. yeah, move capture. We can do in C++ 14, right? That was added. OK. So the comment was we might have wanted to make a s string that called hello and, and capture it. And it's interesting that you bring that up, because I actually tried that here. If I explicitly bound a std function, by, I mean, excuse me, a std string by copy here instead of the car array, it was actually worse performance. And I didn't spend enough time messing with it to understand why. Possibly it works. Possibly because you're within a small string. 
string of because possibly because we're within small string optimization. That's a good point. Yeah. All right. So here's my exception to smaller code is faster code, and I'm not even 100% convinced it's an exception, but we'll see. So here we want to count the occurrences of C in this vector. So we're using std count um, standard algorithm. And this compiles to something that's quite digestible in G++ before 5.0. So, <laughs> do I hear someone say, uh-oh? <laughs> so, so this is a, a little loop. It loops over the vector, blah, blah, blah. All right. This is what happens in G++ 5.1. And um, uh, it, it, it does a lot <laughs> of stuff. <laughs> so let's let's all give G plus plus a hard time, but I'll, I'll point out that current versions of Clang do exactly the same thing. It is uh, unrolling and vectorizing the loop for us. If you notice, it's taking advantage of MMX instructions somewhere in here, I believe, like ten pages back. There. <clears throat> And uh, this is where the compiler writers in the room can tell me if this is necessarily always a good plan. So the compiler is unrolled and vectorized the loop for us. And this comes, this, this example comes explicitly from a Reddit discussion that I saw where someone was posted an article on how to beat the optimizer. And his point was using uh, MMX instructions and, and vectorizing the loop. But it turns out that current compilers do it for you. You're not using MMX instructions, and you never want to. You're not using MMX instructions. I'm sorry. You're using what instructions? SEC, SEC instructions. Um, is, it, is it fair to say that they share the same register names, then? Oh, OK. That's why no one ever uses MMX anymore. No one uses MMX anymore. Sorry. It's using SSC instructions, but I am correct that it's vectorizing and unrolling the loop for me now, correct? So you might see smaller, simpler code that's taking advantage of things like the standard algorithms actually increase your compile size. And uh, like I said, I'm not 100% convinced that this is necessarily a good thing. Because if I'm calling, yes? Uh, so uh, I've been at a conference from uh, Polar LL plus Intel a few years ago. Yes. And there was uh, the first introduced that the later compiler from Intel it will also does it for you, but way more, uh, but, but done in a way more complex way. And it could be useful, but for things like loops where you do matrix operations. Yes. Because these are because these are much because these are much more obviously uh, um, uh, because these are more because these are much more obviously vectorized. Right, okay. So you're saying an, an, an Intel is doing the same thing also, and it's useful for things like matrix oper operations? Yes, but then there is a lot more levels of optimization below it. Yes. So I, I contend that if you are. Um, uh, Let's say hypothetically, I don't want to scroll all the way back those too many slides ago. Um, hypothetically, you um, have this uh, count in a template of its own, and you're calling it with many different types, and they all happen to be very small things, whatever. You're counting the letters in a string or whatever, and it is unrolled and stamped out versions of this for every single template instantiation. Your code can get significantly larger. And just, it's, it's uh, just an anecdote that I have not looked into, but GCC 5.1 is actually a performance regression for ChiScript compared to 4.9.
And I wonder if it's because it's trying too hard in some of these cases. Um, so smaller code is faster code. The summary here for part two, don't repeat yourself in templates, avoid use of shared pointer, avoid std function, avoid st never use bind, never, ever, ever. Even if you want to throw away the arity. <laughs> you can just, in 14, you can just use very edit lambdas, and they'll do that for you as well. Well, the very, <laughs> um, but if you pat, so the comment was in 14, you can use variadic lambdas and they would do that for you. But if in your variadic lambda, you are calling another function and you pass more arguments than you needed to, to the variadics um, call operator, what's that called? Function call operator? Yeah. 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 The, uh, Function call operator. Okay. Um, it, it's, you're going to get a compile time error because you've then passed but, too many. Pr you can have like uh, two normal arguments to the lambda and, and then a variadic pack of anything. Yes. yes. That's that's right. right. Okay. So we can fix the amount, the amount of arguments uh, you actually want, use those, and then accept anything. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, the comment was you could have the parameters that you know that you need followed by a variadic expansion or a variadic list that it that it can throw away. Yes. That's an interesting point. So yes, never use bind. If you're in 14. If you're in 14. <laughs> never use bind. <laughs> Do we have any questions before we move on from here? All right. Did I force the compiler to not vectorize? No, I, I always, for my test cases, I'm, the library that I spend most of my time on is a header-only library. I am 100% at the will of what the users of my library want to pass, want to do. So I, I, I've made a point of it working in every scenario that I can come up with, with, um, with no warnings with any, on any level. It's kind of a pain, but it's worked out. All right. When I break the rules, I, um, I, I commented that you should only use containers other than vector if you have a very specific need to. And one of the obvious examples is std map. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. No, there we go. Std map. I did get ahead of myself. Um, if you've got short-lived maps that are um, creating a, a few keys and then looking them up and then throwing away the map, a, a map has all of the same problems that list does plus more. It's a huge template to instantiate. It does lots of things. It has RB trees. It, um, so I've actually, basically, I, I don't have access to boost in my library. But boost flat map is a potential option. I just have my own. I flattened it out myself in, in some cases. Yes? So I can actually give an anecdotal evidence. Yes? In my dependency injection library, I replaced lots of ma uh, maps and uh, so even some hash maps with flat maps. Yes. And it improved performance because I reduced malloc traffic a lot. Yeah, so you reduce malloc traffic a lot and lots of indirections and following the trees and all kinds of other stuff. Yes? But if you're doing a lot of lookups and querying is the most important operation for you, Yes. Uh, there is an advice that I, I believe was from Mike Lacton at the keynote for Spirit Account 2014. Yes. That it's usually better to have two separate containers, one for the keys and one for the values, as the keys are in a cache-friendly, continuous manner. And you can avoid, uh, you can use less cache memory because if you're putting only a lot of lookups, it's faster to go for the keys. Right. And then after you find the key, just get the corresponding value. So the comment was um, that you might want to have two separate containers, one that contains the key and one that contains the value. So um, just double checking my time. In my particular case, this map um, in ChiScript specifically is the set of local variables that exist in the current scope. And so I basically, I might have, it basically ended up compounding my problem if I had had two, because that would have been at least two um, containers that had to do some sort of dynamic allocation. 
uh, so, but, it, but it's an interesting point, and, and to, uh, just a second, just, um, this goes beyond what I consider the practical performance pattern is another advantage for me of having the vector over the map is I was actually able to save the lookout, the lookup for what position in my stack I knew that that value lived. So I could save the string comparison the second time that I needed to look it up. Uh, but that's not, I think that's a little bit more esoteric optimization at that point. Yes, you had a question or comment? I was, gonna say, I was just curious on, I agree that the vector is, is a better choice over the map, but it's funny if you tried using the unordered list over map. Uh, if I tried using unordered list over map. Um, my experience might be outside of the norm with unorder uh, containers. I used, um, sorry, so what are the names? There's unordered map, right, that uses a hash, hashing functions. So I did try unordered ordered map for some of these things because the order did not matter to me. And I actually got worse performance. Um, and I'm assuming it's because my key is a string and the hashing function on the string, but I don't know. Um, the only case where I've moved to unordered map and actually personally seen performance improvement was where the key is a pointer. It's something integer tiny that it doesn't have to hash. But maybe I'm, I'm outside of the norm here. So I had this problem where I used a stat, stat vector of pairs, and then I moved to hash map, and it got much, much faster. Okay. Than unordered map. Yes. My unordered map is several gigabytes long. Your unordered map is several so gigabytes. It turned out that the the um, the binary search was thrashing the cache too much. So the binary search was thrashing the cache. Okay. Measure, measure, measure. Yes, measure, measure, <laughs> right. Yeah, so this is why, this is, you know, something that I, uh, where I break the rule, not what I would consider to be the normal best practice here. And also on my factories, I take them one step further than the examples that I had um, to, to try to trim down the code size that much more. So um, my shared pointer factory, I am actually... Uh, doing the version where I'm returning a shared pointer from a shared pointer, but I'm not using make shared. I am static casting the pointer that I want. Well, it is, doesn't, yes, this does have to be a static cast because the entire point is to avoid instantiating the constructor for shared pointer of base that takes a pointer to derived. And this silly little optimization is another 2% um, executable size savings for me and 3% better runtime and it's a compile time savings. I don't recommend doing that. Um, but just so you know, I do break the rules. Should we have a make unique with two template parameters? Uh, that's actually what I've created for myself. Yeah. Yes, uh, make unique with two template parameters. Um, I, I think it should exist. Uh, I, I agree, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Bonus slide, avoid non-local data. Avoid accessing non-local data. Because non-locals, local to your function that is, they tend to be possibly statics, which have their own cost associated with accessing them because of the initialize on first use nature of thread safe statics in C++11. It has to check every time you go to access a static whether or not it's been initialized before you can get the value back. Um, they might need some sort of mutex protection if you're in a multi-threaded application. Or they might be in a container with a non-trivial lookup cost, such as stdmap. So uh, in general, I've been moving away my functions from, from uh, accessing any uh, object data or global data of any kind and just trying to pass into the function what I need, moving more even towards static members when I can. All right. So this is the wrap up. You might notice there's still 20 slides left, but <clears throat> it's, we're down to a couple of ideas left. So first ask yourself, what am I asking the compiler or the library to do here? 
always const, always initialize your values, calculate values once, obey the rule of zero, and my favorite that I can't stress enough, if it looks simpler, it's probably faster. This applies to everything. Avoid automatic conversions. Make sure you set your, um, your single parameter constructors and your conversion operators explicit. Um, and there's, there's two cases in the standard where this tends to bite me, and that's accidentally creating too many strings because it's a not explicit conversion from a const car star to a string, and automatic conversions between smart pointer types. Um, avoid using std inline. Always prefer array, then vector. Make, again, make sure you understand what you're telling the, asking the library to do. Don't repeat yourself. Avoid shared pointer. Avoid functions. Never bind. So the results of this, this is the performance graph of ChiScript since version 1.0. Nearly 100 times faster than we were and as you can see, there's been a couple of big gains. This is like doing stuff really stupid at the beginning. But most of them are teeny tiny little incremental changes as I keep making the code smaller, simpler, cleaner. For every commit that I make, I am running a performance analysis. So this is every commit uh, across every compiler branch pair. And this is the work that I've been doing in the last few weeks. And you can see the performance of all the compilers is starting to uh, converge, which makes me happy. It's impossible to see back there, but I actually, uh, two of my compilers switched which one was on top back there, which I find a little disturbing. But, all right. So, anyone think of something that I haven't mentioned here that could improve performance that maybe you would expect me to? Keep it interactive, yeah. I was just going to add to the unordered map problem. Oh, unordered map, okay. Um, I've made the experience that the hash function is very, very important to performance. Okay. Like you, you already mentioned, uh, hashing a string may take lots of time. Yes. And I've made the experience that uh, find, investing time into finding a cheaper hash function pays off. Investing time to find a cheaper hash function can pay off. Wow, that raised a lot of hands. Uh, Marshall. I would just say that uh, the other half of that is uh, investing time in finding a better hash function for your data could, could be a huge win. A better hash if function if, for your data. If you, if you reduce collisions on your hash, your hash collisions, oh. your lookups go much faster. Because of collisions, could, yes, that makes sense. Chandler. I'm going to be contrarian and argue with both of them. OK. Um, so so, so I, I don't think that people should try to find a faster hash function. Not because the hash function speed isn't important, but because I just I, I worry that no one will get it right. Um, <laughs> writing hash functions that don't have really bad collision properties is insanely hard. Um, it's something that very few people are good at. Okay. The other thing is that most standard library implementations now have really fast hash implementations. I know libc plus plus does a trunk. I know libc plus plus does a trunk. I don't know about Microsoft's, but I expect theirs is reasonable. I hope. Uh, the 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 other thing about about you know like changing a hash function to make it good for your data, most of the modern hash functions are incredibly collision resistant. It is extremely rare today to have data which just triggers a bad behavior in a hash function that used to be very common with a uh, uh, Bernstein style string hashing, um, but it's it's relatively speaking rare today. I, I mean, it's possible you should check for collision patterns, but I, I, I think it's, it's statistically incredibly <laughs> unlikely that it happens to you. Okay, so Chandler said, uh, trust your library author because writing a good collision, a good collision-free hashing function is very difficult. Yes, uh, but there's a follow-up, right? There's a good way to get these benefits. Hash less data. <laughs> hash less data. That's, that's how you make your hash function faster. Right? Like right? Refactor your data structure so that instead of being keyed on a large string, it's keyed on a, a index into a table of large strings. Right? Okay. And, and now you have like a small integer to hash instead of a long string. This is much more likely to be effective than, in my opinion, than, than most of the other tweaks for hashing. So use smarter data structures instead of tweaking your hashing functions. Yes. Um, so I suggested 
in, in the custom hash function can reduce collisions. Yes. But the flip side of that is before you go down that path, you need to look at your at the hash function you're using and look at and look at the data you're running through it and determine if the problem is there are a lot of collisions. Right. Don't so just assume that writing your own hash function will will reduce collisions. So measure. First you've got a problem. First, you yeah. First yes. convince yourself you have a problem. Convince before yourself you start yeah. down that road. Measure and then right. try to then make sure you're addressing the right problem. Yes. I want to add one word to Chandler's comment. One word. It is incredibly unlikely to have a lot of hash collisions accidentally. It's unlikely to have a lot of hash condition collisions accidentally. Okay. If you're not in control of the data that you're hashing. Okay. And somebody else who wants you to have a lot of hash collisions is in control of that data. You have a whole other performance okay. problem. So if you have a um, what's the right word? A malicious a malicious user that's attempting to exploit your software. Yes. I, I'm going to follow up. So, so this, <laughs> this is called the hash flooding attack. It's uh, a denial of service attack. It's not just a performance problem, it's a security problem. Okay. Very real problem. Um, but you also better not try to come up with a hash algorithm that reduces those collisions because you can't. Okay, so it's, it's a denial of service attack that you can't address. Like you, you cannot address, no, you cannot address this by changing the hash you algorithm. You cannot change it by, okay, you address it by changing the hash algorithm, okay. No, like if you want to come argue with me sometime, I'll give you all the details. Oh, yeah. Even the cryptographic hash functions have been broken and attacked with hash flooding. Uh, some of them have, right? All of them have. All of them have, okay. All right, so what about const expression? I knew you were all asking. <laughs> const expression is amazing. Um, I was playing around with this uh, const expression safe is sorted. I can pass in this um, this uh, initializer list of values and get an is sorted result back and this compiles down to one. That's amazing. What happens if we remove const expression from these function declarations? It compiles down to one. It compiles down to one. <laughs> Not always. Not always, but uh, yes, specifically, I, I had to enable at least O1 to get this result. <laughs> so, as we've already said, optimizing compilers are amazing. So, for me personally, I use const expression with care um, because I've noticed in my code that if I fully const expression enable a data structure, where I can make all the constructors and all the comparisons and everything const expression, um, it, it, it can make the code compile to larger sizes and I get, I have seen performance regressions. So um, I don't use const expression all the time everywhere. But it's definitely, as we've said many times, in the more corner cases, you always want to profile and test it. So the, the bulk of this talk is stuff that I say do all the time everywhere, and then there's a few things that you measure. Yes? Did you try and look at like, why your code was bigger with constexpr? Um, I believe my code was bigger with constexpr because in the particular case that I'm thinking of, it is... Uh, vectors of structures that are uh, that can be instantiated at compile time because they are based on the parameter types of the functions that are being wrapped by ChiScript specifically. So I believe yes. Uh, there uh, can be very nice uh, um, specific scenarios in which the use of constructions can be very nice. For example. I uh, have seen examples where um, um, you could use context expression to make sure that, for example, uh, the strings are being encrypted at compile time. Yes, you, so you can. So, they are not, um, so uh, the strings that will actually end up in the, the string table are already encrypted. Right, this is to, uh, yes, for compile time checking, context expression is extremely helpful. And if I might go back. <coughs> This actually started as an example where this was a static assert. Um, if you wanted to ensure that you're creating, uh, at compile time, creating your structures that were sorted and you had no runtime cost associated with it. All right, I'm running out of time. 
So why does this all work? Branches and predictions or mispredictions. Code branches are expensive. Simpler code has fewer branches. And according to OProfile now, where I'm now I'm only going back to version 5.1, um, which is my post C++11 conversion. I originally required boost. I'm taking 1.86 times fewer branches now than I was, and I have three times the branch prediction success rate. And my CPU cache hits. Uh, so cache is hundreds of times faster than my memory, thousands of times faster, I don't know, billions of times faster. I, the, there's the graphs that people like to do in their talks where, you know, like it's like a freight train versus, uh, I don't know. Uh, anyhow, so I, I couldn't come up with a good graph. Um, smaller code is more likely to fit in your CPU cache. So, again, according to OProfile, ChaiScript is now 35 times less often hitting the last level cache. I'm 35 times more likely to stay in the fastest cache of the CPU than I was before I started simplifying all of this and shrinking the size of the code. And also, Another reason all this works is that you're doing what the compiler authors expect you to do, and they like it, I'm assuming, when we do what they expect them to do. So idiomatic C++ falls into certain patterns that the compiler expects to find. Well-known patterns can be optimized better. Is that a correct statement from my compiler writers? Thank you. So if you stick with what is idiomatic, good, clean C++, you're helping the compiler help you. Ooh, I am almost done. What's next? We started with this example. This is what the ChaiScript AST parse tree looks like. Um, I am starting to apply uh, myself. I'm attempting to apply the uh, optimization techniques that compiler writers write work. So now this is what my AST tree looks like on my development branch. So I have recognized this common pattern of wanting to do a for loop over a range of integers, and I can simply swap it out at runtime um, when the user gives me script that looks like this. This gives me another 25% performance improvement or something. What's that? Just the answer to what x ends up. Oh, yeah, what is it? It's, I don't know what the answer would be. It's 50, 50, 50? No, no, minus one though, because I'm zero to 99. Sorry. 50, 49. 49, 50, please, you're not doing 100. Right. Um, so uh, I, I contend that any project of any significance is relying on user input of some kind. So I suggest, anyhow, that if your project is relying on user input, maybe there are ways that you can simplify, apply some optimization techniques to the input that the user is providing you, and you can start getting the next level of performance gains. So that's me again. Uh, any final questions? Yes? No except. No except. I did not mention no except. I haven't spent a lot of time with no except. Um, uh, I, I made sure that I applied it where I could when I moved to C++11, but then at the time I was still supporting compilers where I had to have it pound defined and it was ugly. And, um, but yes, that probably gains you a few percent in certain cases also. So what would the rule of thumb be? Use no accept anywhere you can? Right. Just like just like marking it final if you can. Yes, Jana. The biggest performance one from no accept is marking move constructors no accept. Yeah. Marking move constructors no so you get better algorithmic behavior containers. Is an explicitly defaulted move constructor implicitly no accept? It depends on the type of data that's in your structure? Okay. Yeah, because basically what, what it does is that the, the defaulted move constructor and move assignment, you want to do them both. Yes, right. Okay, basically move constructs each of your fields. Yes. Okay, and if those are all no accept, then the defaulted one will be no accept. So if all of your fields that it can move are no accept, movable, then the explicitly defaulted one still will be. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'll also mention a theoretical suggestion for performance, which may get me 
Burton. Well, this, the whole point of this is practical things. I find this very practical. Okay. <laughs> and that is that you mark your move constructors no except. Whether or not they are? All, yeah, just mark them no except, and then you turn off exceptions yeah. in your compiler. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Lots of performance there, I'm just saying. That, that yeah. And, and so now, now you've moved into the realm of undefined behavior when using the standard library, right? Nope. Um, but I tell you, yeah, Chandler, you exceptions Chandler we'll go outside. I'll get, I'll get the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, yes? Uh, if I recall well, the Microsoft Visual Specific Plus compiler has option slash uh, EHSC. Yes. Yes, so you can disable C++ exceptions with them. Yeah, and STL's been doing a lot of work to make sure the standard library still works when he does that. For some value of works, yes. Some, for some value of works, which is exactly my point. The faster value. The faster <laughs> value. Well, straight into the wall. Yeah. <laughs> okay. For, 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 for more common values of abort. For more, okay. Uh, yes, uh, in the back. Let's start. Yeah, right behind you, since you haven't spoken yet, yes. I just wanted to ma mention another thing where sort of performance surprisingly goes up by a lot uh, when you change the thing in your application. I saw once an application where it was doing a lot of string comparisons. Yes. And basically there was a speed up of three if you could like, rephrase it in a few things so that you would replace the string comparisons with the comparisons of the addresses of those strings. Ye string comparisons are sort of expensive, so if you could Right, so string comparisons can be expensive and, and comparing the address, of, well you might have to compare the address of the string first and then the value as a shortcut. I actually do Flyweights that. Flyweights work wonders is what that comment Boost flyweight, okay. <laughs> I use that technique with um, std type info. I compare the pointers first, which is not guaranteed to always be the same thing, and then I do the equals operator on it. And that is a pretty significant performance improvement for me. Yes? Yes. I find if you, um, um, uh, if, if you use the uh, um, uh, CPU instructions from SE 4.2 to build functions like STR and then yes. STR uh, CMP, then these functions are yes. three times faster. I rely on my author, my library author, to do that work for me. To, to uh, make sure that you're using SSE instructions. Well, it kind of comes down to the count of stuff. Uh, go ahead, you've been trying to say something for a while. Uh, can you comment on, uh, does it have benefit using CRTP where you have uh, a class hierarchy and you never want to call through a base pointer? It, it, do you get code flow? Do you, you know, do you get benefit using CRTP? And there are cases in, in my code where I know I could utilize CRTP, but I also know that it would cause a significant compile time and compile size bloat. So I haven't even gone down the road of testing it for this code, because it's the kind of thing where there's hundreds of instantiations of these templates. So I, I didn't, I didn't want to double that number by adding a CRTP uh, version. Yes? Two things, if you do any computations floating point numbers, I think one thing is you can, dis um, you can change the accuracy by you choosing a proper compiler flag, at least. A fast a math kind of thing, yes. Yes, if you don't need accuracy, you don't need to spend a lot of time on that. And second thing, I noticed that uh, many people by default use doubles. Yes. I understand why, uh, if, you, if you need accuracy, absolutely. If you don't need a very accurate result above, I don't know, 10 to minus six, the flows should be sufficient, and with vectorization you can do efficiently in uh, one cycle twice as many operations. So float can be faster if you can take advantage of vectorization. But if you have code that can't take advantage of vectorization, it seems in my experience from the measurements I've done that double is faster uh, if you can't do vectorization. If you can do vectorization, I totally agree with you, but in the measurements I've done, I've seen double coming back faster. But uh, on uh, singular values or arrays, for example? Because the other thing is that you can feed more data into cache line, I guess. Yes, that's true. You'd be less likely to blow out the cache with uh, floats. If you're just giving one-off floats and doubles, it's just a little tiny thing, and you're being dominated by lookups and other things, you probably can't measure it. But yeah. if you're doing intense well, I, I, doubles are not going to be very performant. I, I attempted to measure the difference. Okay. And when a simple thing that wasn't vectorized. 
Like you can't just say, are faster. Yeah, but I mean, and, but doubles are closer to the, the they're more native, right? Uh, I mean, it's the it's not it's not <coughs> not since since x sixty four because all uh, then is long double run through the through the uh, SSC engine and no longer through the x sixty seven huh. uh, coprocessor and that one as far as I know just doesn't care. Okay. Well, my that it can do twice as many float operations. Yeah. It's, speaking of the floating point pitfalls, mind the denormals. Mind the denormals. You know about the denormals, numbers very close to zero. Okay. Is an extension for floating point numbers, and by default, these close to zero computations are being made by the CPU, and they are very slow. If you don't need that extra accuracy. Switch off the normals. Switch off the normals in your phone. You can have normalized Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, we're out of time. You guys are free to leave. We can keep talking if you want to. Thanks. I survived my first hour and a half talk. For the record, it's